optics. So we started off with optics, and then over time, we found that a lot of people who were buying the optics were doing sacks, and so we started doing sacks. Um, I work for the US office, which you, oh, I didn't try this, okay. I work uh, out of the US office. Um, it's in Holyoke, Massachusetts. That branch was actually started out of UMass Amherst. Uh, and uh, we, you see here we have representation all over the world, including some agents, one being in Campinas, uh, in Stru Technica. We have uh, one of their representatives here with us this week at the booth. Um, and this is a group photo pre-pandemic, so it, the group has changed uh, a little bit, but, but for the most part, the expertise is, is uh, the same expertise represented in this photo is there. Uh, we also have a new uh, HQ across from ESRF, so if you happen to do any of your SACS experiments or other uh, at ESRF, be sure to let us know and, and come by and, and see our applications lab. It's very nice. It's the same train stop. It's very convenient. Okay, so um, we have uh, a variety of offerings. Most people are interested in our uh, instruments, but we also sell analysis software and do uh, expert services. This could be like um, collaborations or, or some sort of contracting. But we have multiple solutions. So we have uh, a, a smaller SAC system, a primary SAC system that's more flexible, and then we have one that's specific for biological applications. I'm gonna talk about the Zeus, which is the, the sort of uh, flagship product that we offer. It's the most flexible um, and the most in demand. So um, I don't have to tell you the field of applications, but this is just a, sort of a cartoon slide to show you th that our reach in SACS is, is broad. And also that Xenox has a very strong presence across the world. So I'm not going to spend time detailing each one, of course. Um, I'll highlight Grenoble is where our headquarters are. And then these are a variety of clients we have in Europe. Being based in Europe, that's where most of our systems are. But we also have a new office in China. So we have quite a few systems there. Uh, other regions like Japan, India, and uh, Oceania, ha we have m m multiple systems. Um, and then, of course, me being out of the U.S. office, I'm most familiar with this customer base in, in the U.S. But uh, more importantly for the locals here is that we have quite a decent install base here. This is going to be a combination of... Nano Insiders, which is the small, uh, it's, it's tall and doesn't have quite the footprint, a little uh, fewer options available on it, but a really great system if you're looking for something uh, to accommodate a small space. Um, so this is a combination of Zeus and Nano Insiders, uh, including, thank you, Cristiano. Uh, <laughs> uh, we recently sold the system to LNLS to go on the new beam line, the Sapucaya uh, Sachs beam line. Uh, um, we are also at UNESP and UNIBEI and um, a couple in Argentina here too. Um, so we, we have a, a pretty strong presence here and uh, I, I hope that makes you feel confident and, <laughs> and supported for us uh, if you're interested in getting a system. So I, I'm going to put a bit of a caveat here. I'm, I'm lucky that uh, Already a lot of the hard work is done for me in terms of uh, telling you about these different applications and how SACS works in general. Um, I'm going to take advantage of that and try to wrap up quickly because I know we're all anxious to get coffee. Um, but uh, my expertise is actually in a different field. Um, I come from 12 years of XRD and uh, I studied rocks. This is <laughs> a picture of me at the Herkimer Diamond Mine in upstate New York, US. Uh, it's, it was my first date with my husband. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so I'd like to say we're rock solid. Um, but I've only been working in SACS for about two years. Um, and uh, now I'm surrounded by experts like you and I'm, I'm very lucky to get to learn from people like you. So um, because of the expertise differential here. I'm going to talk more about the features of the instruments and, and not try to uh, explain to you how SACS works. It would be, it'd be silly. So I'm going to tell you mostly about the Zeus 3 platform, as I said. And basically, we'll work our way down the beam path and talk about different uh, options along the way. So first, I'll focus on the uh, X-ray source. 
we can have just one, you know, as, as you guys know, most folks get copper, but we can do multi-energy modules. We can change this wavelength at the press of a button. Yeah, uh, if any, I mean, some of you know more than I do that <laughs> often changing a source took days or at least one day. Um, and now you can do it in a matter of minutes because the source and its optic move together um, along a track and then you can go right back to measuring your samples. So it's, it's a very nice feature and even the liquid metal jet is compatible with this track system. Um, and I don't know if I, let's see. Okay, okay. So um, this is just to show you how, how quick the change is. So this is showing a dual energy model, module, but we can actually have up to three. And this is in real time. So you're seeing in real time how quickly this moves and how quickly you can change your sources. Okay, I think the point is made. Um, we talked about sources uh, at the, the front of the beam line, uh, at the front of the path, but we can actually add more sources. Um, we have what is called an auxiliary source, and this is just an extra source that you can bring closer to your sample in case you don't need all the optics of the SACS path. Um, in that case, you can preserve more of the intensity. So uh, a primary application of this would be uh, you can get one that you can do GI wax with, um, and then it's, it's very convenient so that you can get more signal. Another is that we can actually put an imaging source close to the sample. Um, and this is obviously uh, very convenient if you have a sample where you're trying to map, uh, where you're trying to do mapping of the SACS data across the sample. And I'll give uh, a, a example here. So here is a polymer film that they stretched in the beam. You can see stretching and non-stretching regions in this dark and light, but optical only, you would not be able to see that quite as clearly as you do in this uh, imaging. Now, this is dark field imaging. Um, there's more to come with hope, uh, but, but for now, it's just dark field imaging. And using that dark field imaging, we can map where we collect our SACS data on the sample as it was collected in the imaging. Um, so obviously this is a, a very uh, convenient uh, thing if you're, if you're interested in, in that. So the next uh, portion I'll talk about is in the sample chamber itself. Um, this is the largest sample chamber on the market, it's 81 liters, and this is important if you are doing a lot of custom things or, or you want something big in the beam. Uh, we've had people put 3D printers, polarized light micro microscopes, um, and things like this you can get in the, in the chamber. Custom stages are something we do often. Sometimes we make them. Sometimes somebody says, oh, I used this on the synchrotron and I want to put it in my lab unit. No problem. Most of the time there's plenty of room. Um, the primary goal of this instrument is to bring the flexibility of, of the beam line to the convenience of the lab system. So that's why we focused so hard on making sure that this was uh, a large uh, chamber so that we could accommodate a great variety of, of uh, environments. So I talked a little bit about custom, but also we have a lot of options uh, standard. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about those soon, but each, each one is uh, equipped with a chip recognition that updates motor limits and, and the software to tell you what kind of parameters that you would be defining, such as temperature or, or tensile strength or whatever. Um, so you can do uh, inoperando studies. Uh, this is a, a, a tensile stage. And you can also do it in air or vacuum. We have these really nice, what we call atmospheric cones or atmospheric caps that bring the vacuum right up to the sample stage. And that way you have as little intensity loss to air scattering as possible. As we know with lab systems, we must know the name of every photon. So we don't want to lose uh, any intensity by having that path too big. Okay, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these cells. It's just to illustrate the breadth of the offerings that we have, anything from sealed capillaries to sealed capillaries with temperature, Peltier, uh, uh, temperature stages up to maybe 350 and then up to 1000 uh, C. So we have quite a bit of, of variety in terms of uh, accommodating different experiment types. Um, and most, and, and the main temperature stage that we offer is, is made by Lincoln. And with liquid nitrogen, you can go down to about 150 C. 
We also offer GI SACs, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and also, uh, we have a lot of liquid uh, handling applications. And this is our, ooh, I don't like that. I'm sorry, it's, it's making noise. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know how to stop it, so we're just gonna deal with it. Um, so this is the module that is being installed at LNLS. Um, it is called the BioCube. It is an auto pipetter robot that uh, can also do auto assaying. What happens is it, the robot grabs a pipette tip, it gets sampled from these two well trays. These are two 96 well trays that are covered in aluminum uh, sticker, basically, so that it avoids evaporation. It's also cooled to avoid evaporation. Uh, there's, there's like a, a sample chiller there for the plates. And then it goes into the BioCube here. That, that BioCube has a chromatography fitting, so if anybody's interested in... Okay. This is unpleasant, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Uh, okay, so the, <laughs> it, it, the sample goes into a chromatography fitting uh, opening, which is great if you're doing a small angle, or sorry, small uh, size exclusion chromatography, sex X. Um, it's, it's very convenient so that you can get signal from each species alone instead of getting some jumble of multiple. So um, it gets automatically uh, pulled into the beam and this is a visual feedback, a camera that, that can tell where your sample is. It pulls in the sample, it pulls it out, washes, rinses. All this is automated. The only manual intervention required is to load the samples and to assign the, uh, to assign the experiments to go. This is a new offering for us this year. It's a, it's a Kuwait cell, so um, this isn't a, going to give you rheological data. You would go and do rheology on your sample, and then you would take the shear rate information from those experiments and come and do uh, sh what we call shear sacks. Um, these are polycarbonate um, uh, a, a cell here, and then we have the stator is made of aluminum. The stator stays still, it has a hole in the middle for the x-ray beam to go through. And so that that hole does not influence in any way the, uh, the um, uh, shear that your sample is experiencing, there's a, another polycarbonate cap around the stator. So the rotor is, is what's spinning here. Um, you can see the range of, of shear rates here. Um, and I actually, if, if you're interested, I got to do a little bit of geology. They threw me a bone. Uh, I did some experiments on some clay mineral suspensions with this, uh, with this cell. You can do both radial and tangential measurements on this too. So that's uh, where I got some really interesting data. As I mentioned, we can do temperature and, and I don't have to explain to you guys that hysteresis of, is of incredible importance to any scientist. So, um, of course, you can see here that we're, we have this, uh, this uh, gel, and we're seeing that it heats up a certain way, and it, uh, you're seeing a disappearance of crystallinity, and then it's not recrystallizing the same way. Okay, that's, that's nothing new, but it's just uh, neat to see it in, <laughs> in, in the SACS data. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show a little bit about our GI wax and GI SACS stage. Um, primarily just to show some data of this copolymer film and this pattern silicon on silicon. The primary point of the slide is to show that we can actually get scattering below the horizon, sort of like a transmission type setup, even though you're doing glancing incidents. So uh, you're getting a, a really great breadth of data and you're still seeing anisotropy in, in ordering. Once again, showing that you can see ordering with this glancing incident setup. Uh, it, it uh, sorry, <laughs> the, um, the uh, electrically, it's an electrically conducting polymer and we're showing different degrees of order uh, when, you, when you rotate it. Okay, so we've talked about uh, everything up to the detectors, so that's what I'll focus on next. Um, we have what's called Q-Zoom. It's basically just taking your detector and putting it on a rail so you don't have to uh, go through the pains of adding or subtracting. Uh, if, if anybody's done some of the older uh, systems, you would have to uh, add or subtract uh, 
parts of the uh, diffracted beam path, and uh, the detector would be outside of outside of the vacuum and all of this thing. So you would lose intensity from the uh, little bit of air scattering between the window and the detector, but also the window itself does some absorbing. So this is fantastic because not only do you not have to manually change all that stuff, but the detector is in vacuum and it's windowless. Um, we do have a, a window that you can pull down. It's, it's motorized and automated uh, in case you maybe are working on some liquids that you aren't so sure if, you're <laughs> if there might be some problems with your capillary or whatever, you can protect it. But we uh, operate windowless so that we cannot worry about losing more intensity. Um, okay, so we have a... Let's see, I think it's here. We have a second detector that you can get in case you have time-sensitive samples or thing, you know, things that aren't uh, stable in the beam, or you're just doing some, some kinetics and, and want to get some greater resolution, and, and you can do simultaneous wide angle and small angle at the same time. Um, so the thing that's handy about this is that actually there's an extension of the sample chamber, uh, and the wax detector parks itself completely out of the chamber when it's not being used so that you can still utilize the maximum amount of space in the chamber. Um, additionally, uh, everybody's looking for the biggest detector they can get, right, because you want as much data as you can get. But we actually offered this virtual detector. Um, and what it does is it basically scans. So this detector doesn't only go in Z, it actually goes in X and Y, or uh, sorry, it doesn't only go in Y, it goes in X and Z. So the convenience of that is you don't have to buy the expensive and maybe more complicated bigger detector. You can stay with the smaller detector and still get the same amount of information. Additionally, with these detectors, there are often gaps between the modules, and we can uh, translate the detector slightly to erase those lines that you would see, giving you a more just uh, you can get the same almost amount of information, right? But it's, it looks nicer, doesn't it? It's just pleasant. Uh, okay. Um, and this is showing another reason why you would want a complete picture of the, of the uh, pattern. Because obviously if you're capturing just this corner and, uh, and not the whole pattern, you're not going to quite capture this anisotropy. So we're seeing an aligned and a stretched polyethylene uh, in this beam. Another advantage to our system is that we operate beam stopless. These detectors, while it's not exactly the same, uh, they are designed for working on the beam line. <laughs> and uh, they're often used f on um, X-ray diffraction systems that use 2,700 watt tubes. These are 30 watt tubes. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, we're not worried about flooding the detector with intensity. Um, and not only are we not wanting to throw away the intensity with the beam stop, but we're also allowing ourselves the privilege of working in absolute intensity, which lets us uh, merge our data across those multiple uh, ranges much more easily. Okay. Another thing we wanted to, so obviously high resolution can mean two different things depending on who you're talking to, but here what we mean is uh, the amount of sampling uh, we take per, the delta Q between samples. So here we can actually see these individual phases between the Frank uh, Casper, we can actually see the individual peaks in the Frank Casper phases. Um, okay. And uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is expanding your Q range. So uh, you know, everybody's looking for the greatest range of Q they can get. And one way you can do that is using ultrasacs, which is using a, uh, an, a monochromator before the sample and a analyzer crystal after the sample. And let's see if I can get it to go. And this is sped up, but it's just showing this moves completely out of the sample chamber, once again, letting you utilize the complete volume of the sample chamber when not in use, or the sample chamber when not in use. Um, but it uh, comes up and down as you program it. So um, it's, it's very quick. That's about two and a half times sped up, so, so it moves a little bit more slowly than that. But it's very convenient. Um, OK, we don't need to see it again. 
Okay, great. So I hope that I have convinced you that we are offering the maximum flexibility with fully automated configuration. The idea here is for a grad student to be able to show up and put the samples in and click the buttons and go keep writing, keep writing. Uh, so that's, that's the goal of, of, our, of our instrument here. And I would like to say thank you for putting up with me, and I hope I got you to coffee in time. Uh, this is the US team. I'm not in the photo because I was taking it. So um, hi. <laughs> uh, you, I, I'm not good enough at Photoshop to put me in there. So, um, And then uh, this is a, a sort of my standard final slide of suggested reading, but I'm sure you all have this. So uh, thank you for listening to me, and I'll see you at coffee. Are there any questions for Christine? Hi, I was wondering for your shear system, do you have other geometries for more visco systems like the comb plate or plate plate? Oh, we don't have a plate plate yet. Yeah, we've only got the cuvette system for now. It is something we hope to get built because obviously polymers, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's thank okay. Christine again. Nice. Thank you. We're going to have our photo taken right now before the cough break. So I invite all of you to come here right through this door. And we, we agglomerate around the region here. So we have our, our photo taken. Thank you.